the government of the time, the duly appointed government of the time, in other words, the king, the parliament of England, their local legislators, when they did that, they formed illegal militias and they were terrorist groups functioning against the government and against order and good law. And people like these gentlemen formed provincial regiments, loyalist regiments, to fight on behalf of king and country to support the rule of law and the government of its time period. So, the King's Royal Regiment of New York, if you look, if the King's Royal Regiment of New York can prove the muskets or raise them up, please, raise up your muskets. These are the gentlemen of the King's Royal Regiment of New York. They come from northern New York State, and specifically in the Tryon County area, and they were formed by Sir John Johnson. They would fight throughout the war out of Montreal, coming down south into the Mohawk Valley, and were often mentioned in dispatches. In fact, Sir John Johnson ends up being the senior general of all the provincial forces. At one point, he reaches the rank of Brigadier General. You can put your muskets at the order, please. The other regiment we have is on the other side. These are the Queen's Rangers. Please prove with your muskets. The Queen's Rangers were a regiment, again, a loyalist regiment formed predominantly out of Connecticut and the area around New York, although they would later have permission to recruit, be the only provincial unit allowed to recruit out of the British Isles, specifically in Ireland. Although may, predominantly they were out of the Americas. You may put your muskets down, gentlemen. Shoulder they, in fire. fact, during Ox. the period of the Revolutionary War, the, after 1778, fire. are led by a man named Lieutenant Colonel John Grave Please Simcoe. Shore. And Ox. if that name seems familiar, Class it's familiar because John Graves Simcoe ends up being our first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. So after the war, these, all the, you know, these gentlemen who had served the King so well, yes, the, the, the British end up surrendering after, after the war, but they're brought north because they're being persecuted by the people who've won the war. They come north, they initially the Rangers would settle in New Brunswick, they're reformed and they come along with people from the King's Royal Regiment of New York and other regiments and they're going to come and form a new province in Upper Canada. Well, initially the plan was they would just be given land, which was then part of the Canada or, or, or Quebec. And they said, you know, we don't like this, you know, it was formed in the Quebec Act. They said, we don't like the fact that French is used as the official language. We want to use English, which is our language. We want the, the Protestant churches to be our churches. And we want our own laws as well. So guess what? We separated from Quebec first. And in the end, they come and they come into Canada and the Queen's Rangers and the King's Royal Regiment of New York and the other regiments make this place their home. And this is the founding of what would become Ontario. Now, let's take a closer look at the gentlemen of the regiments. If each regiment could have one gentleman step forward, please. Jerry and Cass, take care, trail arms. Three paces in the front, march. And Jerry as well. So, from the Queen's Rangers, we have Corporal Cherry. On the, the other side, we have Private Cass of the King's Royal Regiment of New York. Let's point out the similarities in their uniform. First of all, both are green jacketed. This means, of course, that they're provincial units. They are loyalists. Now, let's start looking at some of the differences. They are, on the, Mr. Corporal Cherry, is wearing breeches and long gaiters. The breeches are what had been traditionally worn. And the long gaiters protect his legs when he's going through the bush from thorns and, and burrs and everything else. But when we look at Mr. Cast, he is wearing gaiter trousers. This is a modern development. This is an idea which is incorporating both of the other two, but it hasn't truly caught on. By the time of the War of 1812, trousers are much more common. But in this period, they're relatively new, but still a very effective piece of kit. If we look at Corporal Cherry's jacket, if you can point at his wings, please, uh, you'll notice that on the wings of his coat, or near, near where his epaulette would be, there a, there's a wing, and it's colored solid white. This is an indicator that Corporal Cherry is a member of the Light Company unit. Either the, either the smallest or the most agile, often the youngest, Corporal Cherry is not, members of the unit, but he's very agile. Uh, and he's very, being a member of the flank company, he's also very aggressive in persecuting the war and, and being and willing to flank the other guys. Whereas Private Cast is a member of the, the hat companies or the regular companies, so he doesn't have any wings. He, although a very accomplished soldier, is in the main part of the regiment, in the, the main formation, not on the wings. Now, 
in the American Revolutionary War, we often talk about hats. You, know, you can always tell a soldier they love their hats. And in this case, we're going to look at more than just these two soldiers. Private Cherry, sorry, Corporal Cherry is wearing the, the standard helmet of the Queen's Rangers. It is a, although it comes in some variations, you'll notice the Hunter's Moon on the front. This was the symbol of the regiment. It was also a Masonic symbol. It was also the, uh, known as Diana's Moon. It, but the thing is, it's an ancient soldier symbol. Uh, it's also modeled after some German caps. If we ever get to go back in time, we're going to ask Simcoe, please add a brim, because of course, what type of sun protection does this cap have? The answer is, of course, absolutely none. Now, Private Cast is wearing a standard military bicorn. This was a pretty standard hat of the time period, but of course, again, very distinctive, but it has no, no actual worth for protecting your face from the sun. But the nice thing is that if he's firing his musket, it doesn't interfere with him aiming or getting, it doesn't get in his way. The nice thing too is if it rains, there's a waterfall off either side of his head. Always, you know, not to his advantage, but very pretty. Now, if you look into the ranks, you'll see that there's other caps tied around. If uh, Corporal Sanderson would raise his bonnet, please. This is Corporal Sanderson. You'll notice that he's wearing a, bo a feather bonnet. That is a symbol that he is a member of the Highland Company of the Queen's Rangers. So his Scottish roots are coming through. The, if uh, Sergeant Forrest would raise his cap, he is wearing a standard light infantry cap of the period. Notice that he gets a really nice functional brim. We're a bit jealous of that. Thank you. Now, why are the caps so different? Why are the hats so different? That is so at a distance that the commanding officer or the general or whoever knows who's on the field. And because they didn't have walkie-talkies, they didn't have radios, how did they communicate on the field? How did they gather? Well, one of the most important tools they had was one, distinctive uniforms, but the second was actually the regiments themselves had individual, not flags, they're called colors, they had colors.